Okay, welcome everybody to tonight's talk. Um, tonight we've got Coralie Trotter, uh, a friend and colleague of mine, who's going to be uh, presenting her paper, The Unbundling of Psychic Forces. Um, so we've got a couple of talks lined up coming forward. We've got uh, two coming with Leon uh, Brenner and uh, a talk with Mark Soames and uh and two with patricia so just keep an eye out for for the adverts for those talks um but anyway tonight we've got carly and i'm, I'm very happy to have you carly um i'm going to do a brief intro so carly is a, a psychoanalyst in joburg and a clinical psychologist uh, she worked at the 702 crisis center many years ago or 1980s um she runs uh, GRASP, which is Groups for Reading and Studying of Psychoanalysis. I think there's about 80 people and uh, we study different areas of psychoanalysis. Um, she was also involved with the Life Asset Dominion was the key witness and, uh, and that work uh, won her the IPA award for uh, application of psychoanalytic ideas uh, to law. I think that's right, Carl. Um, and then she got the award in London. But now this paper tonight, Coralie's been working on for, for I think some years one could say, actually maybe uh, pre-COVID. Um, and it started with a, 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 another paper, The Faces of Hate. Um, and I'm really looking forward to sharing these ideas. It's been nice to hear bits of it. Um, and with that, I'm gonna hand over to you, Cole. Thanks, Mark. Welcome, everyone. Okay, so the somewhat clumsy title of my paper today is Deconstructing Hate in the Service of Exploring the Unbundling of Psychic Forces During the Pandemic and Lockdown. The presentation leans on my previous paper, as Mark said, Deconstructing the Faces and Vicissitudes of Hate. The original paper was actually written quite arbitrarily um, in honor of Winnicott's hate in the counter-transference mm -hmm. as a result of a request on the Psychoanalytic Thinking Facebook group. And it's perhaps ironic that without having responded to that request, my thinking would not have moved associatively down this pathway. So I'm going to present a condensed version of the paper on the complexities of hate, and then proceed to my thesis about lockdown allowing just under an hour, which is a lot of time for all of us to weave and knit different ideas together. I feel compelled to say, given my proposition, that without great teachers and listeners, this entire project would not have birthed. I'm sure like many other people present, I've swallowed several castrated, apathetic, empty versions of Freud. For better, Mark Soames gave me the gift of Freud proper, and Bonnaby Barrett added a nuanced but pointed version, and all my curious and dedicated colleagues and friends in grasp allowed me to play with Freud, Winnicott, Bion, Laplanche, Green, and Kristeva, among others. So I'm very grateful um, for this, and I look forward to another experience of thinking freely with everyone today. Love and hate, hopefully, are such an intrinsic part of our intimate lives that it's easy to think we all mean the same thing when we talk about either. Isn't it funny, wrote Janet Fitch <clears throat> in White Orlando, I'm enjoying my hatred so much more than I ever enjoyed love. Love is temperamental, tiring. It makes demands. Love uses you, changes its mind. Hatred, now that's something you can use sculpt, wield. It's hard or soft, however you need it. Love humiliates you, but hatred cradles you. And these words are from Cat's Eye, written by Margaret Atwood. Hatred would have been easier. With hatred, I would have known what to do. Hatred is clear, metallic, one-handed, unwavering, unlike love. And Kristeva agreed. We prefer our objects of hate, she stated because they never, ever disappoint us. Hate in the Counter-Transference, Winnicott's paper, occupies an important place in the psychoanalytic literature. 
but it took a long time to achieve this status. The paper presents unpalatable and provocative thoughts, including a long list of why every mother hates her infant from the get-go. This resulted in negative counter-transference when the paper was first presented, and this continued throughout Winnicott's life. I'm reminded of an anecdote repeated about Winnicott giving a lecture in New York on another paper, the use of an object and relating through identification. As he rose to speak, so the story goes, he produced a handgun, a water pistol from his briefcase and laid it upon the podium because he was fed up with being hated and not having his theoretical gestures received. Unfortunately, Winnicott died of a heart attack a few months afterwards. Rock up my baby on the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks, the baby will fall and down will come baby, cradle and all. This unconscious wish to kill the newborn can be seen as far back as Freud's favorite myth in which a baby is wounded and then abandoned on a hillside far, far away. Yet it is hard for parents to know the full force of their murderous impulses and wishes to retaliate in terms of their children, as this passage illustrates. Mrs. Darling first heard of Peter Pan when she was tidying up her children's minds. It is the nightly custom of every good mother after her children are asleep to rummage in their mind and put things straight for the next morning. When you wake, the naughtiness and evil passions with which you went to bed have been folded up small and placed at the bottom of your mind and on the top, beautifully aired, are spread out your prettier thoughts ready for you to put on. Childcare books such as The Contented Baby, The Secret of Happy Children, More Secrets of Happy Children, and then finally rescuing all of us from doubt, conflict, and ambivalence, the complete secrets of happy children, run counter to Freud's assertion that hate is older than love. If all children need a safe environment within which to hate, then an instruction manual, Winnicott would argue, is a mechanical statement, an act of empathic failure, and therefore of hate. Winnicott was criticized for not placing enough emphasis on red, anxiety, and aggression. Red, black, white, those, these are terms used by Andre Green, which is murderous and aims to draw blood as, the, as opposed to the black or white version, which results when the mother is either absent physically or psychically, and when her robustness and resilience is being calibrated. Auden's words, I have no gun, but I can spit, describes the difference between these two forms of anxiety, aggression, and hate. Winnicott himself was also concerned that he was too nice, his words. And you may know he struggled with this in his personal life. For example, not being able to have sex until his father died and being disinclined to pay for his analysis, much to the fury of his analyst's wife, Alex Strachey, who wrote that she wished that Winnie, as the Strachey's called him, would die or fuck his wife all of a sudden. But if you read Winnicott's letters compiled in the, in the spontaneous gesture, he could be as brutal as a pit bull, and his writings are repeat with hate. In a letter to Hannah Siegel in 1952, he wrote, I find I want to say something to you as a result of last night's meeting, and I hope you are feeling strong enough. If not, you had better postpone reading this letter until a suitable moment turns up. I know perfectly well you're capable of being as humble as anyone, but I do think that just at times for a few minutes, you are tremendously cocksure of yourself. And if you happen to be speaking just then, it shows. Hate seems so monolithic, but is it really? In the following intertextual deconstruction of hate, I'm going to suggest that hate can take myriad complex forms that vary in terms of motivation and the fantasies spawned and that it is inevitably and inextricably linked into the fabric of our being. 
Failing to grasp this impoverishes the viability and creativity of relationships, as well as our understanding of society, particularly in the wake of the recent pandemic and various mutations of lockdown. In his 1924 paper, The Economic Problem of Masochism, Freud stated that love can suddenly reverse into its opposite, hate. This is what he meant by ambivalence. The scenario is a result of the life drive being capable of functions far removed from the original ones. The life drive has vicissitudes. It is fluid and mobile. Mobile. It can bind or metastasize and mutate and unfold in ways conceivable and inconceivable. A year later, Freud wrote in Negation, hate is older than love for the infant. In Hate and the Counter-Transference, Winnicott argues that the mother hates her baby long before the baby knows anything about hate. And these statements seem to contradict each other. Klein interrogated the baby's hate and asserted that there's a complex inner theater in which an internal part or quasi-object is mutilated, poisoned, damaged, and destroyed by the infant's bloody hatred from the beginning a hate which she equated with her particular idiosyncratic version of the life drive, of the death drive. In his 1917 paper, Mourning and Melancholia, Freud anticipated the danger of a relationship between an identification with a hated object and an ego-destructive superego beyond term. And this produced one of his extraordinary propositions. The shadow of the object falls upon the ego, and the latter can henceforth be judged harshly by the superego as though it were an object, a forsaken object, and so the ego dies of sorrow. Green later refound this concept, but with a dead object, a black hole, an absence which is never absent and which never dies. But this decathexis of the object is accomplished without hatred, as this would further damage the imago. Is it always true to say that when someone hates, they wish to destroy? Bolos and others have argued that hate is not always the opposite of love. Sometimes a person hates to conserve the object. Such hate may have destructive consequences, but the aim is to preserve a relationship by sustaining a passionate, negative cathexis of it. To complicate matters, Fairburn and Guntra gave us theories of relating in which love, rather than hate, is experienced as unrewarding, threatening, dangerous, and destructive. This is love gone hungry. Winnicott argued that hate and fear inevitably coexist with love in all human relating, and Andre Green agreed. He stated, the anticipation of a meeting between the subject's body and another body, absent or present, can either be an amorous penetration or abandonment, or on the contrary, one of mutilating aggression or invasion. Both threaten, said Green, for better or for worse, the subject's integrity, whether desired or feared. Winnicott imagined a form of hate which is positive, a ruthless love, such as the intensely concentrated, aggressive investment in the meaning-laden transitional object, an object which is loved, preserved, and mutilated passionately before being relegated to the realm of half-forgotten things. Every child needs a safe environment in which to hate. For Winnicott, this was essential partly because fantasy has no handbrake, and seeing hate through to its completion allows us to extricate ourselves to some extent from a projective web. Winnicott called this ordinary hate and wrote, the object is always being destroyed. This destruction becomes the unconscious backcloth for love of a real object. This is a position that can only be arrived at through the actual survival of cathetic objects that are at the same time in process of becoming destroyed because real and becoming real because destroyed. Finally, Beyond noted that all we can hope for in life is to turn bitter hatred 
of reality into a mild distaste. And this is a reference to Freud's negation and to the first statement made, bringing us back to the beginning, hate is older than love. We need, it seems, to distinguish between different forms of aggression and between destructive hate and ordinary or ruthless hate and hate that traps the individual by binding them too tightly to an object of hate. I'm going to draw an outline of how the baby makes a mind using love, hate, pain, pleasure, need, desire, aggression, and experience. And I'm going to delineate this developmental trajectory from a contemporary Freudian point of view and include the concept of Green's non-object relationship. Then this section, I'm afraid, is unavoidably dense and complicated. And then I'm going to discuss beyond the pleasure principle before linking the loss of non-object relationships during lockdown to the impact of the pandemic and lockdown. So many of Freud's texts had a significant impact on Winnicott's understanding of how the mind is made and the developmental imperatives necessary for this. This is true for Beyond and Green as well. In 1905, Freud warns us in his three essays that we must loosen the bond that exists in our mind between the drive and the object, as the object is soldered and represented only through learning from experience. In other words, the object can be absolutely anything and doesn't have to be a person. And this, as you know, is the title of Beyond's first book on the making of a baby's mind. In On Narcissism, Freud argues that a unity such as the ego cannot exist straight after birth. And the Winnicottian infant is also born in bits and pieces with a blueprint for an ark, says Winnicott, that can survive the flood, but has not been built yet. Thus, this infant falls to pieces unless held together. The theories of Winnicott, Bion, and Bean assert that a human being must take the trouble and the time to bring the wish, the world to the newborn in a limited and mediated form, as this facilitates the infant's capacity to be absorbed in going on being and hallucinating and wishing without premature worry about real objects. The real object performs specific essential functions in reality. These functions are internalized and these are therefore non-object relationships, according to Green. Winnicott said that Joan Revere, his first analyst, threatened to turn him into a toad if he pursued this line of thinking in terms of the environment. Nevertheless, he did. In this nursery, the first object is the baby's body and the process of lodging the beginnings of a mind and self inside and investing in these insides. The first opus here is self-preservation, acquiring gratification and a glow, the basis for self-worth, but this implies weaving need and desire with pain and the demand to work, to keep promises and travel the miles before sleep with a temptation to stop in the woods and rest. A nascent flat skin ego, and Zio's term, begins to forge, which means the baby now has a container for insides, for infraverbal body deposits and imprints. This does not necessarily mean that the object is represented as separate at the outset, only that the baby gets to know the person, the caregiver, based on hard neurological wiring and soldering through learning from experience. And Winnicott absolutely understood this paradox. The baby, he wrote, has instinctual urges and predatory ideas. The mother has a breast and the power to produce milk and the idea that she would like to be attacked by a hungry baby. These two phenomena do not come into relation with each other till the mother and child live and experience with each other. I think of the process as if two lines come from opposite directions, liable to come near each other. If they overlap, there is a moment of illusion, a bit of experience, 
which the baby can take either as his hallucination or a thing belonging to reality, end quote. The theme is laid down in Freud's negation, which is the heart of Winnicott's theory. If hate is older than love, then what is hated, if not a separate object? It is not just that the baby's reality is Ptolemaic. To paraphrase Freud, if we were to express this early state of affairs in the language of the oldest oral prototype, the judgment would read as follows. This tastes good. It is good and sweet. I would like to take this in. It shall then be inside me. I want to be that thing. I be that good thing. It is me. Or alternatively, this tastes bad. It is bad and bitter. I need to keep this out. I will spit it out. It shall then be outside me. I do not want to be that thing. It is not my bad. It is not me. And wishing makes this so. The original pleasure ego tries to incorporate everything that is good based on judgment and to reject everything that is bad, creating an initial emotional and psychological landscape consisting of a me and a not me. Freud states, from this point of view, what is bad, what is alien to the ego, and what is external are, to begin with, identical. Hate is older than love because the infant hates an undifferentiated external reality, which the caregivers are part of, as well as internal pleasure, distaste, and frustration, and the demand made by the body upon the mind to work. Hence, Beyond's assertion that the most we can hope for is to turn a bitter hatred of reality into a mild distaste. From the baby's subjective point of view, the experiences which are expelled as not me and which are hated may provide phenomenological relief at an experience near level, but ironically form the abject in Kristeva's terms, or perhaps a primitive rudimentary superego, a gradient of the ego, if we read Freud into textually. The mother object, says Kristeva, is the first result of the process of expulsion of what is disagreeable. This is the original shadow that falls over the ego. In other words, the place inside us that is narcissistically wounded. The infant needs an ontological bubble in order to manage being suspended in this state, a state too disorganized to be able to make effective use of love and hate without the luxury of being able to keep the hated and loved person alive and in, in its mind. As Green notes, in order to be able to say yes to himself, the baby must be able to say no to the object. The mother must accept that he can say no to her. And not only in the form of you are bad, but also you don't exist. The object takes the place of the undifferentiated space in order to take what, it, what is spat out by the baby. The caretaker, says Green, cannot have more belief in the baby's badness than in her own. Bian called this reverie and developed his idea of container contained bad property made good. This negation, argues Eisenstein, is not merely a refusal, but the root of the subject. The initial no is a rejection which distinguishes the inside and the outside and brings the I into being. Saying no is first and foremost an affirmation of identity, end quote. What we hate and spit out is essential to how we define ourselves. The object encourages the intricacies of erotic and destructive impulses by recognizing them, accepting them, responding to them, and allowing their elaboration and so preserving their future. The mother says green gives passion a chance, increases the life force and the pleasure of living. There is another paradox here in that this mother's facilitating value lies partly in her capacity to be fully present and preoccupied with her baby, 
to let things be, to suspend expectation, to be in it up to her neck, and yet to call the baby a baby rather than a burden. Here, says Ogden, there is no such thing as a mother, as the mother must be able to suspend her narcissistic gratification and the need for retaliation and solitude to some extent. The baby, writes Laplanche, is caught up in the orbit of the other, the gaze that expresses desire, love, and pleasure also presents the infant with an ongoing surrounding discourse, the unconscious wishes of the adult. The sensorial dimension between mother and infant becomes the carrier wave for enigmatic messages. And this intrigues and overwhelms the infant who is not yet a speaking, desiring subject. What is this breast that feeds and excites me, want of me, that it does not know itself? What incites me to be so excited? This imposition on the infant, provided it is not wicked, supplements self-preservation, the wiring to attach, and autoerotic drifting and cleaving. So on the one hand, the first me is an illusion because it is cannibalistic in its identifications with the substance of sensations, feelings and messages from a not me. The otherness of the other is blurred and is absorbed in the fantasy of the other, the thing imagined as Freud referred to it. On the other hand, the first not me is emetic and spewing of undesirable contents but this primitive not me is most certainly part of the self. This is the uncanny, the hidden, strange, warded off part of our identity, which is opaque and cannot easily be reconciled with the self. So for Freud, Winnicott, Laplanche, Kristeva, the distinction between object and subject is not as clear as we would wish. And the two pseudo entities, as Kristeva calls them, exhaust themselves in a dialectic of attraction and repulsion. It is this which seeks a home outside over there in the stranger, the foreigner, the refugee, the migrant, the different other in terms of race or religion. Essentially something is rejected from which one does not pass, part. And so love, desire and hate in their headlong coursing towards fulfillment will always yield to the path of least resistance. What cannot be remembered must be repeated. Libido clings to its object, said Freud, and will not relinquish the wish to cure them or renounce even those that have been lost. We seek out what we had and what we know and are fated to an unceasing effort to contain this internal other. There are long stretches of time in a normal infant's life, said Winnicott, in which a baby does not mind whether he's in many, many bits and pieces or one whole being, or whether he lives in his mother's face or his own body. This is the first theoretical hit with the mother, which is wired through a process of repeatedly going over the traces of a circuit created in the mother-infant helix. As previously stated, the real object beyond omnipotent control and with its own volition forms, performs specific essential psychological functions such as holding, mirroring, mentalizing, containing, and use of an object. These are the non-object relationships. The function and process of this external setup is transformed into a framing structure in the mind, consisting of the nodes of satisfaction created when the neurons that fire together, wire together. The structure is generated and perfected before internal objects. But this interior analog to the exterior holds a potential psychic space and provides shelter for objects and their substitutes 
which can be created, mutilated, used, embraced, and discarded. His Majesty the baby needs to fall from his imaginary heaven and approach a frontier of singular importance, refinding the object that was always there in reality so that the process of establishing contact with reality and differentiating between inside and outside can begin. It is now no longer a question of whether something perceived shall be taken into the ego or not, but of whether something which is present in the ego as an image can be rediscovered in reality so that it is ready to be seized when wanted, the reality principle. Freud called this object loss because it involves giving up the first object perfected, the omnipotent self. The infant begins to know in his mind that the mother is necessary but separate and the dependence on the actual mother feels fierce and truly terrible. Winnicott nicknamed this the Humpty Dumpty stage, the wall on which Humpty Dumpty is precariously perched, being the mother who has ceased to offer her lap. There is now a place for experiencing red hatred towards a frustrating object, wounding and poisoning it with its consequent paranoid anxiety. Here we have Klein in full force with all its bliss and health. It becomes possible after this developmental achievement to engage with the dangers and pleasures of forbidden wishes, love, hate, and knowledge and the links between them, as well as the capacity to repair and mourn. So you'll be relieved to know that's the end of the developmental trajectory for now. Beyond the pleasure principle, the 1920 paper is convoluted and difficult, but also critical for the psychoanalytic canon, perhaps even more so in the light of the Corona-19 COVID pandemic, pandemic, exactly 100 years after the Spanish flu, which killed Freud's favorite daughter, his Sunday child, Sophie, a flu which arrived on the heels of World War II. And beyond the pleasure principle, Freud proposed that aggression, narcissism, destruction, and repetition could now be considered integral to both drives, Thanatos, the death drive, and Eros, the life drive. This paper proved challenging at the time, psychoanalytic thinking splintered, and theories tended subsequently to be based on part lines of thought each, however, becoming a general mode of thought. Laplante states that the death drive could now effectively be put to whatever use was required, and the life drive was sidelined, and many theoretic, theoretical reaction formations appeared in an attempt to, re, to reintroduce it. The use of the word drive is unfortunate to describe entropy from the Greek word for transformation which forms one half of Freud's 1920 proposition. Entropy is a force of nature, visible in diverse fields from thermodynamics to physics, chemistry, cosmology, economics, sociology, weather science, climate change, and information theory. It is associated with a state of disorder, randomness, chaos, uncertainty, and disgregation which is the degree of separateness between things. Freud's death drive or entropic force is essentially a conservative, regressive, anarchic force inherent in nature and all life, more the death of the drive and the negation of life and desire rather than a drive, hence the use of the word forces in the title. It tries to reproduce a prior, primordial psychosomatic quiescence where everything goes down to rest, a state free of stimulation, struggle, activity, and tension. It attempts to reduce the tone of psych psychic life to zero and meaninglessness because it is intent on obliterating complexity, cohesion, 
linking and connection. It operates silently and is not interested in objects and so is narcissistic in nature. As Fonicky states, we have in mind a fundamental hostility an undoing of synthetic processes by means of which objects are constituted as such. Without the sense of meaning conferred through projective identification, there is no intentionality in the process. In other words, at this very primitive stage, the mental world of the infant loses its aboutness. The life drive, however, the fuel of the mind is intentional and relational and leans on the seven instincts, essentially the wiring to seek, play, feel, and attach. It consists of self-preservative homeostatic impulses or spontaneous gestures, as Winnicott called them, and a potential libidinal energy, as well as aggression, which is aimed at conserving and affirming the viability of the self. A normal child, if he has confidence in his mother and father, says Winnicott, pulls out all the stops. In the course of time, he tries out his power to disrupt, to destroy, to frighten, to wear down, to waste, to wangle, and to appropriate. Everything that takes people to courts or asylums as a normal equivalent in childhood. Primary narcissism is an ordinary and necessary developmental phase, but failure to refine the object that was always there results in what Green called life narcissism, in which the self is fed at the expense of object cathexis, and this impoverishment hinders the possibility of loving and hating a real separate person. A need such as hunger, experienced through affect, harnesses the pleasure principle and the inherent internal aggression and mobilizes the baby towards seeking and latching. This need is satiated by milk, but also by the mother's attunement, resonance, warmth, affirmation, and love, so that the infant can thrive emotionally and psychologically. Most importantly, it is subject to the compulsions of fantasy which as stated, are fired up and inflamed by the enigmatic messages from the caregiver. As this potential liquid electrical energy courses through the erogenous zones, it reveals its polymorphously perverse nature. Need is libidinized and becomes erotic appetite, excitement and desire. Pleasure is now the signpost to the object and increasing differentiation, the forging of links, and the proliferation of complex, creative, associative pathways appear on the human map as the baby makes up its mind and makes a mind. Eros, the breaker of the peace, the life drive, is everything the death drive hates. It is a brutal dialogue, says Green because the light of the world is blinding and the demands of the body are tyrannical. And if we did not have this psychic formation, conscious and unconscious, cushioning us from shocks, we would still be in a pre-human state. The antagonism between the life drive and the tug of entropy generates yet another titanic battle, adding to the blitzkrieg on the baby. The fix for the psychic colossus is binding. The concept was introduced by Freud in 1895 in the Project for Scientific Psychology. It popped up throughout Freud's works until his last words in an outline of psychoanalysis, where it became an integral part of the theory of the drives. The aggression in the life drive the anarchy inherent in entropy and the warring tension between these forces is contained tonically to some extent by holding it physiologically, for example, in the contraction of muscles, but mainly by diverting it towards the thing out there. This is how Freud expressed it. 
last words, 1938. It seems to be essential for the preservation of the individual that this diversion should occur. Holding back aggressiveness is in general unhealthy and tends to illness, to mortification. A person in a fit of rage will often demonstrate how the transition from aggressiveness that has been prevented to self-destructiveness is brought about by diverting the aggressiveness against himself. He tears his hair or beats his face with his fists, though he would evidently have preferred to apply this treatment to someone else. Binding allows freely mobile energy to be reined in. Excitement is gradually tamed. The tolerance threshold for stimulation and frustration increases. Discharge slows and becomes graded. Frustration, masochism, need, desire, pleasure, hate, sadism, love, it's a long list, eroticism, the sense of mastery, the epistemophilic impulse and voyeuristic and exhibitionistic urges are knitted and woven together. And this allows the ego to decide whether to attempt to obtain satisfaction or postpone gratification or suppress the demand altogether as being dangerous. Binding neutralizes and inhibits all these unbound inscriptions so that none of them dominates and creates order. The cry becomes a sign or ideograph or pictogram or thing presentation and then a word representation and then a symbol. Free association is possible. Aggression, the wiring to attach and self-preservation are consorts at the outset and are libidinized when the baby turns to objects. Nothing happens in the psyche, including arousal of pain and unpleasure without magnetizing erotic excitement and pleasure. And because it is libidinal energy that deflects aggression towards objects, these two energies intermingle lawlessly and mercilessly. But Bound energy does allow for a meaningful investment in work, play, and relationships. On the other hand, the principle of unbinding takes its power from entropy, allowing anarchy, erasure, and an untamed dimension of sexuality and destruction to reign. Representation is patchy and fragmented, and discharge, leaking, action, and foreclosure dominate as the mill itself is continually being dismantled and unbundled. This is negative narcissism, which corrupted by entropy, tends towards non-existence, self-impoverishment, anesthesia and emptiness, leaving a hole in the texture of object relations. The object loses its specificity, its uniqueness and becomes any object or no object at all, the black hole. As Bion noted in transformations, words, circles, points, lines, doodling and whistling become a provocation to substitute the thing for the no thing. Thus actual murder is to be sought instead of the thought represented by the word murder. The drives are never entirely fused or diffused, and nothing is fixed. We will never tie up the loose ends, and we need to keep reweaving the fabric of our being. The strain between what is bound and unbound and rebound is a fundamental dialectical tension constituting psychic human life. In the Freudian project, binding and unbinding repeatedly meet, shape, decenter negate and constitute each other, which brings me to the pandemic and lockdown. You are mine, Fausto said to the flower, the sheep, the tree, and they bowed before him. Even the mountain who did not want to be moved finally said, yes, you are in charge. But this was not enough for Fausto. So he conquered a boat and set out to sea and the sea, unmoved, consumed him in its depths. 
and the sea carried on being the sea, as did the flower, the field, the forest, and the mountain, for the fate of Fausto did not matter. This picture book for children, The Fate of Fausto, was written by Oliver Jeffers and published literally two months before the pandemic started. It is dislocating and points unambiguously at human omnipotence in relation to our planet. The pandemic, described repeatedly as unprecedented, was within the realm of expectation. There are ongoing reminders that we do not have omnipotent control over external reality, and there have been great plagues historically, and more recent epidemics are a signpost to this possibility. As Kerry Danes, a forensic psychologist said while profiling Donald Trump, it was as if Donald Trump got into a staring competition with the virus, waiting to see who would blink first. Well, it wasn't going to be the virus. Our omnipotence is not serving us well. The concept of zero tolerance, for example, towards the virus speaks to this, as does lockdown as a solution to the pandemic. Mother Nature refuses to preference the state of being human. She's an eruptive, unseizable, quasi-object who indifferently asserts that she cannot be tamed, and this threatens to re-evoke states of infantile helplessness and rage. Here is the bitter hatred for an unpredictable, arbitrary reality from which none are exempt. A tissue, a tissue, we all fall down, we sneeze, and the whole world really is falling down, wrote Jonathan Sklar. Chris Steven notes that the word cadaver derives from the Latin cadere to fall. The relentless, morbid, and visceral images which emerged at the beginning of the pandemic of bodies in hospital corridors, bodies on ventilators and pyres, corpses in coffins, corpses in cold storage trucks, undertakers out of coffins, and lines of open graves, as well as the endless ticker tape of numbers reveal the power of the horror of the abject. Kristeva articulates this well in Powers of Horror as a narcissistic wound, which inflicts a threat of physical or psychical death, a fear of collapse, and beyond that, and I think this is the important part, the anxiety of seeing the very borders of the human species explode. She elaborates, there looms within abjection one of those violent dark revolts of being directed against a threat which seems to emanate from an exorbitant outside or inside, ejected beyond the scope of the possible, the tolerable, the thinkable. It lies there quite close but cannot be assimilated. In this recent time with its atomic fragility Dysregulation, capacity to bring humanity to its knees, dread-laden sense of the uncanny, hygiene theater, magical seeking, valorization of being isolated and spectral was dystopian. Lockdown abandoned the homeless and squashed the less fortunate into sardine tins, often without food, and the possibility of using safe protocols. It trapped the fortunate between stone walls without the usual coping mechanisms. Family members in our own, own home posed a threat and we were deprived of a visible enemy through which projection and identification could reflexively course. The primitive, abject, hidden narcissistic wound could not effectively be warded off and seek a home outside there in the stranger, the foreigner, the refugee, the migrant, the different other in terms of race or religion. Of course, finding a stranger to be a carrier for aggression and hatred is essentially morbid, predatory, and damaging. This defense, states Kristeva, is directed in particular at all that has to do with vulnerability, pain, sadness, shame, guilt, abjectness, pity, rage, and envy. And then the other is no longer recognized as kin. This is the salt of tragedy. 
George Floyd begging to breathe for a very long and bearable nine minutes being an example. As Pontelis states, once this hate has elected its prey, it does not budge. It is a hate that knows. She is never in doubt. She understands everything. And this can lead to people being objectified, stripped of human status and devalued and becoming targets for oppression, persecution and violence as we know only too well in South Africa. But precisely because of our apprehension in this regard, perhaps we have failed to register the subterranean gain of being embedded in ordinary social and communal fabrics. In a subtle and in inadvertent way, it may be that we use projection and introjection to secure and tether aggression, frustration, helplessness, and murderous impulses through myriad insignificant interactions and collisions from the moment we leave our homes. Daily exchanges and connections may be fulfilling a reliable, unremarkable form of binding as people become partial and intermittent, ordinary carriers for our anxiety, rage, and hate without this being put into action and without the use of excessive projective identification. These are the non-object relationships that serve essential functions in an everyday way in daily life. What do I mean by this? South Africa had one of the hardest lockdowns in the world. Leaving your home was not permitted unless you had a permit or were buying food or essential items. And this did not include clothing as anyone knows who had a child who grew during this time. It was an era of prohibition, exercising on the road, walking dogs, alcohol and cigarettes were banned as were all takeaways, including a much sought after Woolworths rotisserie chicken. All outdoor public spaces, such as beaches and parks were off limits. Gyms, restaurants and religious buildings were closed as were all shops not selling food. We were locked in with ourselves and those we loved. I remember many people telling me at the time that they went shopping for food every day, armed with sanitizer and masks, just to see other people they had to resolutely avoid. I live in a very large, vibrant city with six million people in a country with a complicated internecine history. It is a city with many people on the bread poverty line who live in townships and squatter camps or are homeless. It is a city which swerves towards disrepair, lawlessness, violence, and anarchy. Yet somehow the center seems to hold. Experiences of the pandemic and lockdown obviously varied widely. And I'm writing this short narrative from the position of a white privileged person in order to try to make sense of why the world seems so mad at the moment. The pandemic and lockdown fortunately were not traumatic experiences for me. My own lockdown was three months short, after which the kids went back to school and I returned to working face to face with patients. My first experience of the city every morning is the school drop off. In Johannesburg, other than myself, very few people know how to drive properly. Hooting, gesticulating, yelling, and digging deep for some choice words is all part of this journey. It is such a ritual that my children have organized multiple traffic infringements and offenses into boxes or schema, which are updated daily. This includes fighting with Google Maps when it is clear to me that the route chosen is incorrect. It is common in the city I live in to see people at traffic lights begging, performing or selling things to survive. I felt concern about Eric and Sydney, both of whom disappeared from their robots during lockdown and then worried at how much weight they had lost when they returned. However, the daily confrontation with desperation is painful and can feel like a burden and result in irritation, hostility and guilt. Watching another driver 
navigate an intrusive encounter of this nature can be captivating. For example, there is a practice of squirting dirty, soapy liquid onto the front windscreen. First, the windscreen wipers go on furiously, and then the car jumps forward epileptically before roaring off in outrage when the robot turns green. Paying taxes and engaging with call centers typically provide opportunities for unleashing and reining in aggression, particularly when the person whose salary you're paying and who is meant to be helpful clearly hates their job and wishes they could throw a brick at you. Cues and people who jump them, the person behind you in the queue who assumes you come from the same space ideologically and starts up some random unwanted conversation, feeling grumpy because the person behind the till serving you is even grumpier. Of course, when the person in front of me is rude to the grumpy person at the till, I take pleasure in judging them. All of these might be called terrible delights by Betty Joseph, but perhaps they facilitate a process of binding. And then there is humor at someone else's expense. When the president of South Africa announced the lockdown, someone thought it was a good idea for him to demonstrate how to put a mask on. The mask, unfortunately, had a mind of its own and landed up covering Cyril's eyes. Within hours of being told about lockdown, there were endless mocking memes making fun of him and referencing the movie Bird Box. If I can't see Corona, Corona can't see me. We prefer these objects of hate because they never disappoint us and they allow us vicarious gratification. I'm nearly finished reading Lanny by Max Porter to my son. After writing this paper, I saw the book, a bleak book, in a new light. Lanny has gone missing and his mother is knocking on her neighbor's door, Mrs. Larton, Lanny's mom. I could hear her wheezing approach, slipper shuffling down the hallway, hissing and nattering to herself like a fairy tale witch. Hello, Mrs. Larton. Have you by any chance seen? She interrupted. Are you an educated person? Because I would have thought the words no parking on the verge were fairly intelligible, fairly explicable to someone even with rudimentary schooling. And she slammed the door. This is the conversation from Mrs. Larton's point of view. I could see her waiting out there, twiddling the strand of her mop, biting on her lip and fidgeting like a nervous teenager. I took pleasure in slowly unbolting the door one lock at a time and said, I have gone out on a limb to welcome you to our village. And I did especially ask that you don't park on the verge. She muttered about her flashy husband and tried to change the subject to her peculiar little child. How rude. I politely closed the door. I felt quite virtuous. I jolly well put her in her place and I was pleased to have done so. I felt relieved. Lanny's mom. I blushed and felt tears prickling. I disliked confrontation and I was embarrassed. I was outraged. I fear and despise her and obsess about her. My husband jokes that I will murder her. I am going to kill a not very well disguised version of her in my next novel. I knelt down and said loudly into the letterbox, Mrs. Lawton, have you seen Lanny? Mrs. Lawton, can you believe she pushed open my letterbox to scream abuse at me? I was quite frankly baffled by the show of impropriety and aggression. I'm going to need at least two episodes of Antiques in the Attic to relax me. I was furious. Lanny's mom, what if we said what we really felt? What if I did murder Mrs. Larton? The world would be a better place. How lovely it would be to kick in her door and ask her again. I just wondered if you'd seen my son, you awful bitch, you pissy cling film hag. And by the way, I hate, hate, hate you. I feel sick just thinking about your yellow stamped lamb's ear, fuzzy upper lip. You're the worst thing about England, about villagers. Mrs. Larton, what if one really said what one felt? 
What if we, the generation of people who remember the war, told these frightful, entitled young people that this is a country we fought for, that you cannot simply buy a sense of belonging on your mobile phone. I'd like to tell her about the real community around her, a community that is dead and gone thanks to people like her. She may as well be a bloody foreigner. And there we have it, an ordinary neighborly relationship, allowing both involved to contain their hatred so that actual murder is not necessary. Two pseudo entities exhausting themselves in a dialectic of attraction and repulsion. Auden wrote in the cupboard, the desert sighs in the bed and the crack in the teacup opens a lane to the land of the dead. You shall love your crooked neighbor with your crooked heart. The teacup, an ordinary object associated with friendship and ceremony, has a crack in it through which we can see entropy and chaos. We can also glimpse our crooked heart, crooked hearts and love and hatred for our crooked neighbors. This is white and black anxiety and aggression. These are non-object relationships. Perhaps the stranger performs a benign psychological function, that of binding psychic forces through the drama of alternating estrangements, antipathies, antagonisms, and reconciliations, but of course can also be used in a morbid way, that of a receptacle for the wicked, abject messages, our own narcissistic woundedness. The daily ordinary orientating rebindings fall on what Green called the Mobius strip or framing structure laid down during infancy and childhood. External frames, such as the psychoanalytic frame or the controversial discussions or constitutions or homes mirror this interior analog and as stated, either hold a potential psychic space and provide shelter for objects, which can then be created, mutilated, used, discarded, embraced. A home is an interface between our fragile body and the powerful forces of nature, between individual solitude and the social pulsating metropolis. It is a meditation and elaboration of self other boundaries and homes are designed to elaborate these zones and fields that separate and link the self and others, continuously negotiating these transitions, currents, and transactions, rather than to isolate people. In a letter to Einstein, Freud wrote, the organism preserves its own life, so to say, by destroying an extraneous one. Obviously, Freud meant this at a symbolic level, which is one of the wars had such an impact on him. The dialectical tension that exists between individuals in shared social spaces allows aggression and anxiety be, to be diverted and identity to be affirmed. I'm not asserting that we need to be in a feverish, frenetic, combatant state with each other every day, but I am suggesting we use binding tactics and strategies and theories of the mind and environments to manage daily life and ensure our needs are met. And this creates a strange, invisible order in which entropy, chaos, and madness are less freely mobile. Lockdown, perhaps even in places like psychiatric institutions and prisons, mobilizes, I think, a strange kind of unbundling and decathexis. And I believe this sets in motion vicious, dangerous reaction formations in an attempt to pull psychic forces back into a weave, an attempt to find the stranger in a morbid way. When the ordinary expectable ways are not available in an unremarkable way, the noise, pressure, and turmoil increase until they are unleashed, until there is a war and a clear enemy. As Juliet Mitchell argues, the law of the mother 
states that you cannot kill your sibling, but you may go off to war and kill someone else's sibling. The increase in mass shootings, rape, and suicide rates, particularly adolescents, certainly in my city, and the endless unnecessary deaths unrelated to COVID, and political leaders run amok, reveal the impact of the diffusion of the drives and the loss of non-object relations. I think as ugly and unappealing some of these ideas are, many of these binding encounters anchor us and allow us to give full consent to the dreadfulness of life and our lack of omnipotence in the face of a planet raging with fire, fires and floods. It is potentially a brutal dialogue and doesn't mean, as Chris Stever says in Hatred and Forgiveness, that we shouldn't turn back, look back, investigate the self, continually question and rework psychic damage into something useful and creative by acknowledging our shared vulnerability. I love and hate my city, but won't leave it. Because as Frank Bidart says, then in the voice, then the voice in my head said, whether you love what you love or live in divided, ceaseless revolt against it, what you love is your fate. For myself, I have found a newfound perspective on all the crooked parts of myself that are contained generously every day because I'm part of many communities which act like a mycelial safety net for the tightrope of being human.